Good evening, everyone. Uh, tonight, we'll be having two Bible readings, one from 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and the second from 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Starting from 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 22. Jews demand signs, and Greeks look for wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews, and foolishness to Gentiles. But to those whom God has called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God, and the wisdom of God. In the second reading, starting in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, at verse 19. Though I am free and belong to no one, I have made myself a slave to everyone, to win as many as possible. To the Jews, I became like a Jew, to win the Jews. To those under the law, I became like one under the law, though I myself am not under the law, so as to win those under the law. To those not having the law, I became like one not having the law, though I am not free from God's law, but I am under Christ's law, so as to win those not having the law. To the weak, I became weak. To win the weak, I have become all things to all people, so that by all possible means I might save some. I do all this for the sake of the gospel, that I may share in its blessings. Well, good evening, everyone. My name's Ken. Uh, if you are uh, new or visiting uh, WBC, Wollongong Baptist Church, we're really glad that you've chosen to be here with us tonight. And if you're a regular here, we're glad that you're here as well. As uh, Stuart said, tonight we're starting a new series that we've seen, Conversations That Matter. Over eight weeks, we're going to discuss a range of issues on which we are well aware that there is significant differences of opinion. Our goal in doing this is not... Uh, to cause offence. We, we're not going to try and say that your opinion's wrong, ours is right. We genuinely want to understand where others are coming from. We want to feel the weight of conclusions that people have come to. We want to understand what comes out of, if you've made that decision, that that's what, the way that life works. That what are the implications for that, whether you've taken our view or somebody else's view? Now, in hindsight, we realise that Christians have not always been particularly great at listening. Uh, we haven't always taken the time to slow down, to attempt to understand when people disagree with things that we've made uh, conclusions about. Often we've uh, attempted to win the argument rather than win people. And so our goal in having this series is to better our conversations. We want to actually understand where people are coming from so that we converse, that we can talk with one another rather than at one another. And so as a reflection on that, our stage is set up a little bit differently to how it normally is. We have a, a table uh, and stool rather than a pulpit or lectern. We have chairs, comfy chairs facing one another, allowing somebody to sit around a table and have a conversation. It's a symbol, a physical representation that we don't want these talks to just stay in this building, but that they'll go out there to conversations, that people will literally sit down uh, over a coffee with somebody who will be sitting there and you'll have conversations at work in that break that you have. Uh, people, you'll invite people over to your house to have a meal, that you'll go over to somebody else's house and have conversations about topics that really matter. Now, I have in my hand a, an open Bible, and it also is a symbol, a reflection that, that we come to these conversations aware 
that we have a perspective, that, that we're not coming to this thinking that we can come to any conclusion that we want to. We want to be guided by God's Word. Uh, and so we're not pretending that we're neutral and that we come to this with, with no uh, background or no baggage. We do. We want to be submitting to God and His Word. We also recognise that these issues, uh, come along with these issues, come emotions, anything that's important to us, that's, that's dear to our heart. If we talk about it, if we challenge it, uh, if people have a different opinion from it, well, that raises a response from us, and that's to be expected. It's normal. But we're also hoping that by doing this, that we'll understand where others are coming from that differ from us, that we'll be able to, to think through, well, how did they get to that conclusion so that we'll actually be able to have conversations with people, that we'll be able to reflect on ourselves and ask the question, are we doing things, are we, are we saying things in a way that makes it harder than it needs to be for people to hear about and understand who Jesus is? That's the goal of these, uh, this series. Uh, and if it allows other people to understand the message better, if it, under, if it helps us to be able to think through how we present the message better, then we believe that it will be worthwhile. So we're going to pray uh, to, to reflect the fact that we're dependent upon God for this to work. Uh, and so will you join with me in praying? Lord God, we do thank you for the opportunity we've got to meet together here tonight, to be able to think about uh, important issues, to reflect on ourselves, to reflect on those that we interact with. And Lord, we do want to be able to have better conversations. We don't want to to fight, to get into debates where we criticise one another, but that we can genuinely have empathy, that we can really understand where people are coming from so that we have real two-way conversations. Lord, if we're left to our own devices, that's not going to take place. Uh, and so we ask that you would do your work in us uh, by your word, that you'd bring about change in all of us so that we would live in ways, speak in ways that honour and glorify you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, if you've known me for any time at all, you know that Christy, my wife, and I lived in Thailand for 12 years. And for the first two of those years, we lived in a small rural province called Dark. It's spelt T-A-K, but if you pronounce it correctly, it's pronounced Dark, kind of like dark, but with a T. Now, it's a, it's a place that the word dark itself is a Thai word. It became the name of this province and it means hung out to dry. And when we had days of 40 degrees plus, both in the daytime and at night, for weeks on end, we learnt that dark deserves its name. It's not a place that foreigners, foreign tourists, particularly like to go and visit for a holiday destination. There's another province that's called Thrat. T-R-A-T, and it's a little bit different. It's a beachside province, uh, the, the gateway to a whole bunch of tropical islands, and naturally it's filled with foreign tourists. When we'd been living in Thailand for about six months, learning the language, learning the culture, we decided to go on a holiday down to Thra. After we'd spent about a week at the beach, we had to go back home on the bus to Tha. And so we stopped off in Bangkok and had to buy tickets. And the conversation went something like this. This is me, this is the Thai person selling tickets. And we're speaking in Thai. Can I please have two tickets to Dark, please? Sure, here's two tickets to Dra. No, 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 you've misunderstood me. I said, can I have two tickets to Dark, please? Not Dra, we've just been to Dra for a holiday. Here's two tickets to Thrak. Foreigners don't go to Thrak. You want to go to Thrak, not Thrak. Here's two tickets for you. They're actually cheaper. And that's where you should be going. Now, it's not the uh, who's on first skit of Abbott and Costello fame, but there was a clear breakdown in communication. The words that I was saying were not making sense to this Thai ticket seller. Words that I said didn't communicate because of his existing understanding, his experience, his beliefs about what foreigners should and shouldn't do. In hindsight, 
it's quite funny. At the time, it wasn't particularly. (laughs) But looking back on it, I can understand why our communication broke down. There There were things in the situation that just led to this funny mistake. But I think our experience, the reality is, is that most times we face communication breakdowns, it's not all that funny in our own relationships with people that we love. When there's a a communication breakdown, it causes great pain. In our society, played out publicly over recent times, there's been a number of very high-profile debates on which there's been communication breakdown. The whole same-sex marriage. Uh, Israel Folau's posts on social media just this week, as Stuart made reference to, the abortion debate. As people find themselves on one side or the other. The people who hold a different opinion to us become the the opposition, the enemy. As we talk with them, as we interact with them on Facebook or hear the things they say, we don't understand what they're saying. They don't seem willing or capable of understanding what we're saying. There's communication breakdown. Each side passionately holds to their belief. And often this degenerates into us calling the other side stupid. Why won't they just listen to what we're saying? But if we could all step back and reflect for a moment, what we might realise is this is probably a case of one man's trash is another man's treasure. Now, we see this played out literally on the council cleanup as, as things that we determined had no value. Put them out on the side. And then somebody comes along and realises that there's a treasure there. What we valued, or what we didn't value, somebody else does value. And obviously it does play, uh, come into play with physical rubbish. But surely the saying is actually more about things that are, that are not physical. We have differences of opinion on the value of uh, what's the best sport, what's the, the best food, what's the best political party. Where's the best place to go on a holiday? And on many of these things, we can just choose to disagree. If you like your meat and three veg, well, that's fine. I'll enjoy my Thai curry. You can like a particular brand of car, a particular mobile phone, a a, a particular way of dressing. And and it's really no skin off my nose if that's what you want to do. But what about the more important issues, the the things that are important to us, the the hard issues on which we really care? What do we do about those when we come into contact with somebody who disagrees with us? Which raises the question for tonight, which is the, the overarching question really for our whole series. How can we have conversations on important issues if we disagree with one another? How can we have conversations that matter? Now, we're going to attempt to answer that question under three headings tonight. Firstly, what is our current situation? Secondly, what are two possible responses by Christians to this situation? And thirdly, what is required of me? So three headings, current situation, possible responses, and what is my necessary response? So firstly, an analysis of where we find ourselves in 2019 Australia. If you're taking notes in your handbook, uh, first point, our current situation is that our society has changed. It's changed dramatically. It's changed faster than probably any other time in history. Things that were considered completely normal just 30 years ago are no longer considered normal. Now, I was fortunate that I went to school at the time that the cane was going out of fashion. For decades, perhaps centuries, the cane had been the choice of weapon to make sure that students who were unruly got back on the right path. How did our society change so dramatically, so quickly, that something that was standard procedure is now considered barbaric? It's a dramatic change and it's happened very fast. And there's a whole host of complex reasons for why. And yet the majority opinion has changed on what is good discipline. And we could make the same analysis of all sorts of other things. What is good food? What is good manners? What's good uh, things that we should be doing with our time? You name it. 
changes take place over time in societies. It's the nature of all societies, including our own. The thing that perhaps is different is that rather than changing from one particular way of seeing things to another particular way of seeing things, what we find today is that we're left with diversity. There's a whole range of views of what is and isn't appropriate. And into that status of diversity, tolerance is promoted as the number one way of dealing with it, the highest ideal. Given that there are so many different opinions, we just have to all agree to disagree. So you can like what you like, and I'll like what I like. But conflict inevitably arises when we disagree over the boundary of where public and private intersect. In theory, tolerance allows me to have my own opinion on all sorts of issues. But in practice, it depends whether my personal opinion impacts on others. And so theoretical tolerance says, you're passionate about the environment, that's great. Just don't demand me to be. But as soon as I exert my right to build an incinerator in my backyard and burn all the plastic packaging that comes in through our household door, well, all of a sudden, it's not just my issue. It's impacted on other people. And when private and public intersect, public trumps private on many, many issues. This principle relates to issues like vaccination and global warming. But it's having a massive impact on Christianity because the change in what is considered publicly acceptable. Historically, Australians have uh, been influenced by Christianity. I didn't even realise until uh, I was preparing this that the Australian Bureau of Statistics has been around for a very long time. Their first ever survey that they did was back in 1901. And in that survey, they discovered that 96% of Australians self-identified as Christians. The, the, the overlap between private and public was almost one-to-one. -one. They were the same thing. Yet in 2016, just three years ago, the number of Australians who now self-identify as Christian had already plummeted to 52%. And the trend is a, is a, is a very sharp nosedive. Australian society is now very divided on their opinion about who Jesus is, whether Jesus is valuable or whether he's rubbish. To some, Jesus is our highest treasure. It's the ultimate honour to be called by his name, to be able to live the way that he has instructed us to live. For other people, he's just irrelevant. For us, for some, we consider God, Jesus to be the embodiment of God's love. For others, they can't think of any reason why we should value Jesus more than any other historical figure. If we are Christians, rather than just condemning that view outright, is there a chance that we can actually take the time to think, how did people come to that conclusion? And I think we can. As a believer in Jesus, I also believe in Julius Caesar. If I had lived in his day, in one of the areas that he ruled over, no doubt he would have had a huge impact on my life. But I cannot remember a single time where Julius Caesar has had an impact on a decision that I've made, a choice that I've made. How should I live my life? I don't consult Caesar's teachings when I have questions how to live. My interest in Julius Caesar is merely historical, although his salad is reasonably good. And I think for many Australians, their opinion of Jesus is much the same. Historical interest, Christmas is kind of nice, but apart from that, there's just really nothing that Jesus has for me. Now, McCrindle Research has investigated this exact issue, and they found that whilst half of Australians consider Jesus' life to be of importance in the history and culture of the world, only one in three consider Jesus' life to be extremely or very important to them personally. Almost two in five Australians believe Jesus' life is not at all important to them personally. That two in five, that's a lot of people that you are going to meet. And their opinion, their, their valuation of Jesus, 
could be very different to your own. Many Australians believe that Jesus no longer deserves to have public space. Christianity is a private matter, so keep it there. And so our experience of tolerance in 2019, I think, is a lot like my back deck. This is a photo that I took just yesterday. The occasional place, there's a little nail that's sticking up above where it should be. Now, if one of these road nails is in a place where I don't walk, it's off to the side somewhere over, hidden away, well, I tend to just ignore those ones. But if I walk along and I stub my toe on it, it's, it's in my way, then I go and get the hammer and I knock it back into place where it should be. And I think that that's what a lot of people are doing with our beliefs, with beliefs about Jesus. You can believe what you want, so long as you keep it over there, out of the way, in private. Talk about Jesus in private as much as you want. But it's no longer polite to bring him into the, the political discussions, the issues about ethics or education, like an object from the past that was really, really valuable but has been put out onto the rubbish. So Jesus has been tossed aside by many in Australian society. So how as Christians should we respond to the situation that we find ourselves in? I'm going to suggest that there are at least two possible responses and this is where we'll go to the passage that were read from 1 Corinthians. So point two, if you're taking notes, two possible responses to this situation by Christians. The first response I'm going to call the leaving everything to God response. In the first reading from 1 Corinthians, Christ crucified is a summary of all Christian teaching. Stripped back to its bare bones, Christianity is rightly seen as all about Jesus dying for us. This message, this good news, is for all people. But Paul is clearly aware that people will reject the message about Jesus. This is not a new response, unique to 2019 Australia. Paul divides the world of his time into Jews and non-Jews or Gentiles. Jews, he summarises, sought miracles, a, a demonstration of God's power. And if you know their history, you know that that makes sense. Rescued out of Egypt from a foreign power, taken through the Red Sea, through the wilderness for 40 years, receiving miracle after miracle after miracle. It was natural for Jewish people to seek miracles. Gentiles, on the other hand, sought wisdom. And even if you have only a cursory understanding of history, even today we are aware of Greek philosophy, of democracy, things that resulted from the Greek empire's focus on thinking, of evaluating, of coming up with better ways of doing things by our thought processes. And in our day, sorry, as in our day, people in Paul's day had already decided what was most valuable and they lived in line with their pre-existing conclusion. And so it's no surprise that when Paul preached Christ crucified to this audience, they responded by rejecting it. Jews rejected the message because Jesus crucified was considered weak, the opposite of what they were seeking. It wasn't a display of power, it was a display of weakness. Now, non-Jews rejected the message of Christ crucified because it didn't match up to their superior logic. Hearing the claim that Jesus was crucified in their place, both groups ignored the message and just got on with life, sticking with what they already believed. Preach Christ crucified and the message is rejected. Now the hope from Paul's perspective, knowing that that's going to be the outcome, is seen in verse 24. Despite the normal response of rejection, God would call some from both of these groups, from Jews and Greeks, and they would come to know him. God would do something special in some people from both of these groups so that hearing the message of Christ crucified, they would respond and put their trust in Jesus. Paul himself, the, the writer of this letter, 1 Corinthians, is a great example in whom this process took place. Initially, he rejected Jesus out of hand because Jesus didn't match what Paul expected, what Paul was valuing and looking for. In fact, 
claims that Jesus was the saviour of the world made him so angry that he sought to kill the people who were teaching it. Not very tolerant of him, was it? Now, it took an extraordinary intervention by God to change Paul's mind. Paul didn't sit down on the lounge with his Christian friend and have a cup of coffee and talk about Jesus. Jesus had to step in in a very, very dramatic way, which could lead us to conclude, if that's all the information we had, that God is the one who brings about this change of heart all by himself. And that means that we can leave all of this to God. Our responsibility, according to this way of thinking, is that we stop with preaching an unaltered message. Tell people that Jesus died for him and leave the rest up to God. That's the leave everything to God response. But the second passage that John read for us, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, reveals that if we stop there, we've actually stopped far too soon. It is true. We must preach an unaltered message. We must tell people about the crucified Christ. But that's not the end of the story. And Paul demonstrates what I'll call the moving towards others' response. 1 Corinthians 9 makes it clear that while God alone is the one, the only one who's capable of changing hearts, we too have an ongoing obligation. While the message must not change, we must be willing to change. The way that we live is still one of the most important grids through which people interpret the words that we say. For Paul, this meant that to preach crucified in a way that was going to make sense to the people whom he was speaking with meant that he had to learn to live like the locals live. When he was talking to Gentiles, he lived like a Gentile. He dressed like a Gentile. He ate food that the Gentiles were eating. When he was talking to Jews, he, he lived like a Jew. He didn't eat the food that the Gentiles were eating. He went along to the temple. He could do the things that people were doing. In order that, they would see that the message was important. One of the outcomes of Jesus' crucifixion being the sole means by which we are able to be right with God is that different cultures can make their own conclusions on what is appropriate food, what is the appropriate style of dress, what counts as Christian music. There's a whole range of issues on which God has given us each freedom. Verse 21 makes it clear that this doesn't mean that we have the freedom to do anything at all that our culture might approve of. And yet Paul realised that unless he adapted on neutral issues, people would think that to accept Christ crucified meant that you had to change things that in reality God wasn't concerned about. Rather than demand people to move towards Paul, Paul sought to move towards them. Now one of the, the ways that that was worked out was that Paul changed the way that he spoke. And we often do this automatically. We present a message differently depending on who we're speaking with. When young children ask us, Daddy, why is the sky blue? They're not asking for the scientific explanation of the absorption of certain frequencies of light by the atmosphere. We adapt our language and the concepts to match who we're speaking to. We start from where people are at, understanding the question behind the question. But this shouldn't just be our practice for kids. Why can't we do it with everybody that we talk with? It's a very well-known novel, To Kill a Mockingbird, and the main, one of the main characters, Atticus Finch, says, if you can learn a simple trick scout, you'll get along a lot better with all kinds of folks. You never really understand a person until you consider things from his point of view, until you climb inside of his skin and walk around in it. If we are going to have conversations with people that have come to different conclusions to the ones we have, if we're going to work out how the message of Christ crucified can make sense to them, we are going to have to do the hard work of walking around in someone else's skin. We cannot know what makes others think the way they do unless we stop to take the time to actually think about it. Do we climb inside the skin of those who 
differ from us? Or do we just get under their skin by telling them, showing them where they're wrong? How did they come to the conclusions that they came to? Have they changed in time of their thinking? What, what brought about those changes? Rather than simply demanding everyone to agree with us, we need to spend time thinking about how people came to their conclusions, talking with them, asking them to, to give, the, give us the time to explain how they came to their, to their view. It would be very easy for us to assume that people are stubbornly ignoring what we consider to be the truth about Jesus, simply because they want to live life on their own terms. And that is a possible reason why people are motivated to live that way. But often it's far more complicated than that. Have we considered that perhaps something in how we've presented is actually contributing to people's rejection of Jesus? Have we neglected to emphasise something in the message of Christ crucified that would make more immediate sense to them? Are we living in such a way that non-verbally we're communicating to people that they have to change something on which God has actually given them freedom? And so point three, what is required of me? And can I have your permission, uh, first of all, to speak to anyone here who does not consider themselves to be a Christian? I understand that Christians quite possibly have offended you, have misunderstood you, have made you feel looked down upon. It's very possible that tonight, unintentionally, I've done all of those things right now. You may look at Christians and think that we've all got our heads in the sand, refusing to keep up with the times as they change. But can I encourage you to have another look at Jesus? 2,000 years ago, both Jews and Gentiles rejected the message of Jesus because it didn't match their existing beliefs of what is most valuable, what matters. And while a lot has changed, in another sense, nothing has changed at all. You might not look for signs or for wisdom as the Jews and the Greeks did. But what is it that you've already determined is most important? The thing, the grid by which you're measuring Jesus. I think that for many of us Aussies, we long for a future security. So we study hard and then we look for a good job. Once we've got that occupation, we attempt to climb the corporate ladder to, to get better and better at, to establish our own business. When we get older, we top up our super or make investments for a rainy day. We're doing all those things because we want to secure our future in a very uncertain world. And when we hear Christians talk about Jesus dying on the cross for our sin, we just scratch our head and it seems to ignore, well, that's got nothing to do with my greatest need. But if we'd consider Jesus' death from another perspective, he actually dies to guarantee your eternal future. Trust in Jesus and there is nothing that can take away a certain future, not even death. Jesus is the ultimate investment. Have you ever considered the possibility that in Jesus your greatest need is met? Whether you're seeking future security like that example or acceptance, maybe you're someone who seeks after justice or peace, perhaps you just want to make it to the end of next week. Jesus did die to save us from our sins. But more than that, he is the ultimate fulfilment of every desire that you might possibly have placed on the highest rung. But for us, and most of those here, will already be Christians, we have to do more thinking like this. We need to ask ourselves, are we willing to be adaptable for the sake of others? Are we moving towards others or are we demanding them to move towards us, to understand things from our perspective? It's very easy to blame people for their unwillingness to change their mind. We think that we've explained something perfectly clearly. Why are this person so incapable of listening? Why can't they get what's so obvious to me? But that was not Paul's response, and it shouldn't be ours either. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 22, Paul said, I've become all things to all people so that by all possible means I might save some. 
There's a clear passion which was driving Paul's behaviour. He's not naively thinking that his efforts somehow guarantee that everyone's now going to respond positively to Jesus. He knows that even as he makes this attempt to move towards others, to make it more comprehensible, that still only some will accept their need for Christ crucified. And yet, even if just one extra person responded positively to his adaptations, it was well worth it. Both both of these passages, 1 Corinthians 1 and 9, make it very clear that we are responsible for sharing the good news about Jesus. We all know that it's hard to do, that it breaks today's society's current taboos, that people don't necessarily like to hear about Jesus in public places. If we speak about Jesus, people may not like us. Relationships that have been established for years or even decades could become increasingly tense. And yet it doesn't change the fact that if we've received the good news, there's an obligation upon us to share the good news. There's something about receiving grace that makes it incredibly selfish to receive it and then just keep it to ourselves. And yet the lengths that Paul was willing to go to, I think remain a challenge to all of us. This was brought home to me uh, one time when we were living in Thailand. A friend of ours invited us out to eat at one of the local stalls that are by every street side. Chicken intestines were served, a great delicacy to some, and sorry for the mixed metaphor, but it was not my cup of tea. And yet by choosing to eat this terrible-looking, horrible-tasting chicken intestines, I communicated to the other person that he was important to me. I valued what he thought was valuable. Growing up as a Jew, eating pork for Paul was not just weird or icky, something strange that turned his stomach. Paul had believed that for his whole life, that to eat pork offended God, that it was sin, that it was disobedience of God's commands. And yet when God revealed to him that it's not through what we eat that we can be made right with God, He was willing to do what made him uncomfortable if that opened up the potential to talk with more people about Jesus. If it might help conversations make more sense to the person listening. Paul chose to live in such a way that it demonstrated to all of those around him that they didn't have to become like Paul in every way. They just needed to trust in the crucified Christ. 1 Corinthians, which we've dipped into just very, very briefly in these two little passages, is a letter from Paul to one of the churches that he helped to establish. The book of Acts, also in the New Testament, records the history of the early church and and Paul is one of the key figures in it, going around and doing exactly that, starting churches in all sorts of places. At the end of the book of Acts, we get a fascinating close-up of Paul in action doing this, preaching Christ crucified. Though he tried to present the message of Christ crucified to Jews in a Jewish way, it didn't change their response and some people got really, really angry. So angry, in fact, that they attempted to kill him. Some Roman soldiers rescued him and taken into a a strange mixture between interrogation and protective custody, Paul eventually ended up behind the most important leaders of the Roman Empire at that time, accused by the Jewish people of rebellion and all manners of crime. Two men, King Agrippa, uh, was invited by another man, Governor Festus, to investigate if Paul was really guilty of some crime. And Paul takes this opportunity, while he's on the witness stand, while he's on trial, to preach Christ crucified. Which, if you read the details later, the end of the book of Acts, you'll see that what it means is that Paul takes into account Agrippa's existing beliefs. He shows how Jesus is good news, even for a Roman-appointed king. And in Acts 26, verse 28, we hear Agrippa's perception of what Paul's been doing while he's on the witness stand, supposedly, you would think, fighting for his own life. Then Agrippa said to Paul, Do you think that in such a short time you can persuade me 
to be a Christian. Paul clearly didn't just present the facts about Jesus. Paul didn't try to get out of the situation. He sought to show how Jesus could make a difference, how Jesus was the fulfilment even of Agrippa's uh, beliefs. He didn't trot out the one-size-fits-all gospel presentation that he memorised beforehand. He adapted the good news of Christ crucified to the man who was sitting there opposite him. And likewise, we need to take into account where people are at as we share the good news of Christ crucified. This will require some of us going outside of our comfort zones. And even tonight, our stage, our style of presentation may be making you feel a little bit uncomfortable. It's been stepping far outside of my comfort zone, I can assure you. We haven't done this just to do something different. We haven't done it to intentionally cause offence to anyone. We're hoping that it raises the question, are you willing to give up your comforts if it more effectively communicates Jesus to others? Now, we're going to finish our time together tonight by celebrating communion, which I think beautifully demonstrates some of, the, uh, some of God actually enacting the very principles that we've been talking about. God has good news to communicate to us. It's a complex message. It contains theological reasoning that's way beyond my capacity to understand. And yet Jesus chooses to simplify the message for us. Taking a meal that was already familiar to his disciples, a meal that communicated the idea of rescue. Jesus gave items of food a new meaning and yet a meaning that was still connected to their former meanings. This bread is my body, broken for you. Take it, eat it, in remembrance of me. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this whenever you drink it, in remembrance of me. 1 Corinthians chapter eleven twenty six 26 says, For whenever you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Every one of us is able to take a cup of juice to eat a piece of bread. It's a simple act, and yet it proclaims a profound message. Some people uh, will be thinking that what we've done here doesn't show enough respect for God. We've changed things just for the sake of change. And yet that's not our intention. We hope that it's much more than that. What we're doing is a symbolic meal, a simple meal. And yet it's a proclamation declaring the same message that Paul preached, Christ crucified. We don't do it in exactly the same way that the church in Paul's day did it. Things like in our society have changed over time. And yet regardless of how we do it, the message remains the same. Jesus' death provides our life. Now the servers are going to come out the front now and they're going to distribute both the bread and the juice. If you are a believer in Jesus here tonight, whether you're a member here or not, doesn't matter, Jesus invites you to take, eat, with thankfulness for the sacrifice that he's made on your behalf, on our behalf. If you are not a Christian, then just allow these things to pass you by and instead think about the message that they're intended to communicate. As we regularly do here at Wollongong Baptist Church, I encourage you to hold on to the cup when you receive it until everyone has got one and then we'll drink together another symbol, a symbol of our unity. So they're going to come out now and when we've all received the cup, uh, I'll pray for us.